Math 150, Section 2, Lecture 4. We are trying the new technology today. We will see how well it does. Okay, the purpose of today is to talk about equations of lines. So the reason we need to do so much with lines is the big idea in Calc 1 and 2 is you reduce any complicated curve to locally it's a line. Okay? And so, it's okay, we just got your background. So if something can be reduced to a line, we need to understand lines. So you should have learned three different ways of doing equations of lines in school. <coughs> Anybody want to give me one way they like? Okay. Points up. That's my thing. The names were chosen to make it very easy to remember what inputs you need for the method. All right, for point slope, let's try a point and a slope. So I'll write x naught, y naught for the point. I'll write m for the slope. And you get y minus y naught equals m x minus x naught. Okay. What's another method you've learned for lines? Ah, uh, yes. Point, point. Oh, so this is a slightly different order than 9 a.m. This is good variety for me. Point, point. So we need two points, x naught, y naught, and x1, y1. So how do you get the equation from two points? Find the slope, yeah. That's basically the only way I really know how to do it, is from these two, you can compute the slope is just y1 minus y0 over x1 minus x0, and now use point slope. This highlights how a lot of good math is. You reduce it to a problem you already know how to solve. Right, and there's a third way. Uh, slope intercept. Slope intercept. And so you need a slope. Usually we talk about the y-intercept. There's one type of lines where it's not enough to know the slope-intercept. And these are the vertical lines. Because they all have slope plus infinity, and none of them have an intercept. But basically, this is telling you where do you hit the y-axis. And the equation is y is mx plus b. And so if x equals 0, then y equals b. This is where it crosses the y-axis. A lot of times, even if we start off with something with point slope, we in the end want to write it in the slope-intercept form. Part of this is we like to view y as a function of x. You tell me my x-coordinate, and I now have my y-coordinate. In two dimensions, this is fine. But what happens, have, how many of you have in high school or algebra in junior high done the equation of a line in three space? It's possible to have a line in three space. I've got one here. Everything we're doing here is just working in the special case of a plane. That's not going to be good enough for multivariable calculus. So this is where we're starting to get dividends for all the stuff we've done on vectors. When we are done <coughs> writing equations of lines and vectors, we will then go back and visit or revisit these equations and see, can we recast these in vector language? Can we understand what's going on? Now, I've been talking about dimension 2, dimension 3, dimension 4. Most of you are used to dimensions such as these nice integral dimensions. I will show you an example of something today that is not integral dimensional and hopefully connected to something you've been seeing for years. When you think about a line, you should think about a starting point and a slope. The slope is really giving you a direction. Okay? So what I want to do now is lines in three space. So I'm going to be writing down the equations of lines in three space. There's really not much of a difference between doing it in three space or doing it in n space. So in three space, I'll use x, y, z. If I was doing n-dimensional space, I would use x1, x2, all the way up to xn. It doesn't really make much of a difference. We're very fortunate that once we go from one to two dimensions, oh, I'm sorry, from two to three dimensions, we've already got all the complexity that comes in that it's not really harder to go up to four or five or even n dimensions. So because of that, I'm going to just focus on three dimensions on the blackboard to just make it a little bit easier to pass and process, but really it doesn't make much of a difference. So I need, instead of point, so I'll call it point direction. 
So I have some point P naught, X naught, Y naught, Z naught, and I have a direction V. So one way to view a line is I have some base point, and then the line is all points that start there and are going off in a certain direction. So you know, imagine you're shooting an arrow. I don't think I can say shooting a gun. I could get into trouble with that with all the laws now, but an arrow is an old enough technology. You're shooting an arrow in a vacuum. It will just continue to go in that path. So let's draw this. Here is the origin of our coordinate system zero. Here's the point P in space over here. Well, actually the point P naught. And now I choose my direction V. And then my line is supposed to be like that. So I'm going to write L of t to denote my line at time t. And I really want to view t as time. And the equation is just going to be p0 plus t times v. So what's the easiest value of t to plug in to try to understand what this is? Zero. So if I take t equals zero, I just get the point p naught. Good. You know, I told you this point p naught should be on my line. It's on my line. Excellent. And then one second later, I move one unit from p naught in the direction of v. Two seconds later, I move two units in the direction of v from the point p naught. Negative half a second earl, uh, half a second earlier, or negative half a second, I'd be moving negative one half v going in the opposite direction. So this would be the equation of a line. And you could write this out in long form as you know, x of t, y of t, z of t. I will often be casual and go back and forth between writing my vectors as column vectors versus row vectors. For this, I think it's easier to write it as a column vector. Would be my point p naught, so x naught, y naught, z naught, plus t times v, um, I'll call it vx, vy, vz. And if I wanted to now, I could get x of t is x naught plus t vx. y of t uh, is y naught plus t vy. z of t is z naught plus t v of z. In all of these, I start off at some point, and this tells you how much I've changed that coordinate. You know, for a given amount of time. So a line is a physical object in space. This is a parametrization of a line. Is this the same object if I wrote, say, L of t was p naught plus 44 t v? That's another line, yes. Yeah. So is it the same line? It's the same line physically. What would be the difference between the two? Um, probably you'd be moving faster. You'd be moving faster. So how much faster do you think you'd be moving on this line? Yeah. 44, 44 times. Right? So in one second here, you've moved V. In one second here, you've moved 44V. So it's physically the same thing, but your speed could be quite different. <coughs> So depending on the problem, you might want to adjust your direction. We frequently might want to use this as a unit vector. So v hat, which would be you know, v divided by the length of v, that's a unit vector. Maybe I might want to do L of t is p naught plus t v hat, and use a unit vector in the direction of v. All right, so this is the equation of a line. Is this the same as what we had before? You know, does this look like what we started with all those years ago in Algebra 1? Yes? So this does look a lot like y equals mx plus b. Now it's going through a point. So the question is, how can we interpret, I mean, it, it feels a lot like point slope. So if we go back to what we have over here, we can write y equals 
equals y naught plus m x minus x naught. And that looks, you know, again, similar to what we had before. It's y is where we started, and this is how much we moved. So a lot of mathematics is doing nothing. We're going to see that later today. You can add 0, you can multiply by 1. I can write x as x naught plus x minus x naught. I'm lecturing slightly differently than the uh, 9 a.m. section. If you don't like this approach, watch the 9 a.m. section. It's slightly different. It's really, really boring to give the same lecture twice. All right. So you know, I get to test things out on the 9 a.m. Oh, 9 a.m. people don't be listening to this part. So I can test people at 9 a.m. and tweak it a little bit here. Okay. What number should I put in front of the x minus x naught? Yes. Well, right, right, right now, I, I, I want this to be true. What's the only number I can put in front of here? One. One. Now, you often don't need to write a one, but there are a couple of times in Calc 1 where it's useful, you know, especially when you have like the chain rule or the power rule to put in this one to remember that certain terms are present when you generalize. I want to write it like this so that this kind of looks a lot more like our vector equations. I'm trying to motivate where something comes from. Is this second equation really worth celebrating in junior high? x equals x naught plus 1 times x minus x naught. What is the right-hand side reduced to? x. x equals x. Okay? Do we really want to bother students in seventh grade, whatever, with x equals x? So basically, we, we hide this equation from you. Do I really need to tell you x equals x? No. And so I hide that, and you've learned for years, you know, y equals y naught plus m x minus x naught. But really, this is lurking. Well, now when you look at that, what does it look like the direction vector would be? And maybe I want to write them in the opposite order. I'll have y equals y naught plus m x minus x naught. So now they're written in the same order. So this over here, that looks like my x of t, y of t. This looks my initial point. This is how much time has elapsed. So view x minus x naught as time elapsed, time from, what do you think the direction would be? Yes? Um, One comma m. So if you think about it, what does it mean for line to have a slope of five? It means if you change x by one, y changes by five. What does it mean to have a slope of pi? You change x by 1, you change y by pi. So if I wanted to try to figure out what is the direction in this case, if the slope is m, the direction vector is going to be 1 comma m. In one dimension, as soon as you know x, do you know y? Yes. But in several dimensions, if you know one, do you still know the others? So could you have a line that has, if I give you the x coordinate, is the y and the z coordinate uniquely determined? If not, then that would mean there would have to be two values, two places of the same height above the same x. Or so two, two places of different heights above the same x. It seems like in three dimensions, if you know x, you should also know y and z. And what's really looking down is you can view all of these as a function of time. So as soon as you know what x is, you know what time you're at. And then since you know the time, then you can calculate the y, and then you can calculate the z. So a line is a one-dimensional object. Once you know one piece of information, it's all forced upon you. A plane has two degrees of freedom. You need to know a little bit more. And so here, if I want to try to write things, 
I can write it as, you know, L of T is, you know, P naught plus TV. And that's going to give me exactly the same equation of a line as before. So think of X of T as just X naught plus T. At time zero, we start at zero. So it really does reduce to the equation of the line you've seen before. All right, here is a very crappy piece of chalk. Okay? How many of you have taken basic physics? What will happen if I release this crappy piece of chalk? It will fall on the floor, and you can even see the chalk from 9 a.m. Okay? How would you calculate how fast it will hit the floor? Acceleration to gravity. So how do you calculate the kinetic energy? One half mv squared, okay? And what is the kinetic energy equal? Yes? Not quite, almost. Almost the potential energy before. How do you calculate the potential energy? Mass times gravity times height. Okay, and where is height zero? Why? Does height zero have to be the floor? Could it be the ceiling? Yeah. Yeah. Could it be the desk? You get to choose where height zero is. You get to choose your coordinate system. It's not the potential energy is converted to kinetic energy. It's the change in potential energy is converted. So you look at how much it's changed between the two. And just for those of you who are dying to see the chalk fall, okay. All right. So you get to choose where you define height zero to be. It's very similar to a line. Do I have to have this as my base point? No. I can choose any point on the line, and that will be a perfectly fine base point. I don't have to choose x naught to be time zero. I have freedom in terms of doing that. But if I want to write things down in coordinate systems, if I want to write things down like this, it helps to have an initial point. It helps to have an initial time. Normally you have freedom. Sometimes if you have a problem, a very natural coordinate system will introduce itself. Since it's going to land on the floor, it would be really nice if it has no potential energy when it lands. Let's make the floor ground zero. So a lot of times, good notation is forced upon me. A big question you might have in three dimensions is, when are two lines equal? So one thing is you could look for a necessary condition. If two lines are equal, they have to be in the same direction. So I, if I give you two different lines, I can calculate the direction. How could you calculate the direction for two lines? Well, but I might not give it to you in the form of P0 plus TV. I might give you a bunch of equations. Maybe I give you one line is, you know, x of t is, you know, 3 plus you know, 4 t, y, although it's beginning to look like, if I write it like this, you'll pretty much quickly see what things are, 4 plus 7 t, z of t is 8 plus 9. So if I write it like this, you can see the direction is just 4, 7, 9. So as long as things are written nicely like this, you're, you're going to be absolutely OK. So if not, just take two points on the line and look at their difference, and that will give you the direction. And then you can see if the two directions are the same. How can you see if two directions are the same? If they have the same slope. Have the same slope. So how, how would you check the slopes? You can just check like the relative scaling. Do we know any test to tell if two vectors are in the same direction? Dot product. Dot product. So if, what would the dot product have to be? Zero. Zero. Zeros, that's perpendicular. Yeah. Wait, shouldn't the cross product be zero? Ah, so if the cross product is zero, they're in the same direction. Is that the only way the cross product is zero? Mm -hmm. So did we have a test with the cross product that if your v cross w is zero, and they must be parallel. 
as long as V and W aren't in the same direction, they will, they will create a parallelogram, which will have some area. So that result that I was making fun of last class, well, here's a way you could use it. You could calculate the two different vectors, and if you don't want to figure out if they're in the same world, take the cross product. I think it's a bit of an overkill, but that's a type of problem you could have. But this is really nice. This is you know, parametric form, and it allows you to figure out where you are at every moment in time. And the big input is t. Once you know one of the values, everything else is determined, because there's really no freedom in a line. Okay. Any questions about equations of lines or examples you want done? Okay, so what's nice is this is stuff you've basically seen before. You've seen this for years. All that's going on now is we're just generalizing this to higher dimensions. Okay. What I want to do now is I want to do some fun applications, and I want to do at least a little calculus today. So I'll go back and show you that with probability one, almost all of you have been lied to by at least one calculus teacher in your life. They have snuck something by you that they should not have been able to do. And so my goal is to sneak things by you, of course, but at least be honest when I'm doing it. So I want to talk about some strange sets. And this gives me a chance to introduce some notation, which we're going to need throughout the semester, as well as show you a little bit where all this math goes. So how many of you have seen the Cantor set before? Excellent. So the way it works is at every stage, you throw away the middle third of everything that's left. So we start off with the initial segment 0, 1. It has length 1. We now throw away the middle third. So we get 0, 1 third, 2 thirds, what is the length of what remains? Two thirds. Now let's do this again. We have zero to one ninth, and then two ninths to one third, two thirds to seven ninths, eight ninths to one. What is the length of what's left? So what's the length of what is remains? Four ninths. Four ninths. And how else could you view four ninths? Two thirds squared. Remember. At every stage, I throw away one third of what is left. If you throw away one third, how much do you keep? You keep two thirds. So as you iterate this more and more and more, in the limit, what will the length go to? Two thirds, two thirds to the end. So if you let n go all the way off to infinity, what do you get? You get to zero. You get to zero. So in the limit, the length of the Cantor set is zero. So does anything remain? Do any points survive? I keep throwing away things. Does anything remain, or have I thrown away everything? Well, zero, one remains. Ah, zero remains. Zero is always going to be here, and one is always going to be here. There's at least two points in the set. Okay. What about one third? Will one third always remain? Well, let's see. One third comes down here, and then I throw away the middle third of this, so then I'll have um, 2 27ths to one third, I think, will be the next one. One third will always remain. In fact, every endpoint, once it is present, will always remain. Because you're only throwing away the middles, you never touch the endpoints. So every endpoint remains. Turns out nothing else remains. You're left with just the endpoints. So the length of what remains is zero. But amazingly, the dimension of what is left 
is not zero. It's also not one. It's somewhere between zero and one. It's a fractal set. Uh, fractal is because there's a lot of self-similarity. If you've seen like the Mandelbrot set and stuff like that, we'll see a little bit more of this later today. There is a really interesting way to look at all the endpoints. We are familiar with decimal expansions, with base 10. Why do we like decimal expansions? So you just blindly do what people do before you. Your parents say, we learned the decimal system. You're going to learn the decimal system. And this is why we have the monstrosity known as QWERTY. All right, who knows what QWERTY is? <coughs> yes? So why is the keyboard set up with the QWERTY system? Yes? Yeah, they would get jammed. People would type too quickly, and the little things would link up. So the typewriter was actually designed to slow people down. Think about this. We are now using keyboards designed to slow people down on old mechanical typewriters. How many of you have actually used a typewriter? OK, it's larger than expected. <laughs> All right. Sometimes we are stuck with things for no good reasons. If we really loved you, we would have adopted the alphabetical or even better, the Dvorak keyboard before you were born. Why haven't we done that? i got to be careful. I am not saying your parents don't love you. <laughs> I don't actually know if they love you. Um. <laughs> Why haven't we adopted the Dvorak or the alphabetical keyboard? Yes? Yes, it's hard for us. It would be good for our kids. It would be good for the next generation, but we, no, no thank you. We're sticking with a QWERTY keyboard. Why do you think we use the decimal system? I'm sorry? The notation sticks. Well, wh why would we want decimal notation? I mean, raise your hand if you know the answer. Right? We have 10 fingers, right? Mm -hmm. For most problems, we like to do our numbers in base 10 because we have 10 fingers. Right? For this problem, it's not good to work base 10. 10 has nothing to do with this problem. What base do you think we should look at for this problem? Base 3. So if you look at the base 3 expansion of a number, well, I would write instead of 1 tenth, 1 hundredth, 1 thousandth, I would write 1 third, 1 ninth, 1 twenty seventh. So every number up to one third begins its ternary expansion with a one. Every number from one third to two thirds begins its ternary expansion with a, I'm sorry, everything from zero to one third begins its ternary expansion with zero because you haven't reached a third. Everything from one third to two thirds begins its ternary expansion with a one because you have one third. And everything from two thirds to one has a ternary expansion beginning with a two. Now, over, so we throw away everything with a 1 in the first ternary digit. Over here, we now throw away everything with a 1 in the second ternary digit. So in fact, the only numbers that are left are the numbers that have no 1s in their ternary expansion. So the Cantor set is all numbers without a 1 in its ternary expansion. So that means I can write my number x as you know, dot x1, x2, x3, x4 in ternary. And I can write this, you know, calculus as x1 over 3 plus x2 over 3 squared plus x3 <coughs> over 3 cubed. Or using summation notation, it'll be the sum k goes from 0 to, I'm sorry, from 1 to infinity xk over 3 to the k. And so again, a lot of what I'm doing today is I'm trying to review notation and concepts you've done in previous classes in a fun way, rather than just saying, let's just talk about series expansions. That's not that much fun. I'm trying to find, at least for me, what I would consider a fun problem. All right. So now, when we look at this, I can form a new number y, which will be 
x1 over 2 over 2 plus x2 over 2 over 2 squared plus x3 over 2 over 2 cubed. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking every ternary digit of x and I'm dividing by 2. Well, since these numbers only have zeros and twos in the ternary expansion, I'm just going to get zeros and ones here. And then I'm changing threes to twos down below. This is now a binary expansion. So binary is just base 2. So what we're essentially doing here is we're saying that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between writing a number in a ternary expansion with no ones and writing a number in binary expansion. So this means that the number of points in the interval in the Cantor set is actually the same as the number of points in the interval 0, 1. They're just arranged in a very strange manner. Later in the semester, if people are interested, I will show that the dimension of the Cantor set is equal to the log base 3 of the number 2. Whenever you see a number, you want to get a sense of how big is it. So you may not know what the log of 2 base 3 is. If I change the 2 to another number, you might know its log. What number could I put here instead of 2 where you would know what its log is base 3? 3. What's the log of 3 base 3? 1. So this is a little bit less than 1. I could also put a 1 over here. What's the log of 1 base 3? 0. So it's greater than 0. The Cantor set has a dimension somewhere between 0 and 1. Okay? So what I like about this is we get to talk about series expansions. We get to talk about writing things in base 2 rather than base 10. And we can see the dimension is a little bit different than you might expect. All right. I want to do binomial coefficients now, and then I'll show some op movies, and then show some uh, a fractal movie. Okay. Any questions about binary expansions here? Okay. How many of you have, it's okay if you haven't, how many of you have not seen binary, I'm sorry, binomial coefficients? Okay. So, is there a difference between being president and vice president? Yes. yes. The joke a vice president made many years ago when asked, what is your job? Basically said, you die, I fly. <laughs> My job is to go and express the condolences of the United States of America on this sad occasion. In student government, is there a difference between representatives? Are all representatives equal? In student government. Oftentimes in, in student governments, all representatives are equal. And so we often talk about when we have uh, collections of objects, does order matter or does order not matter? So n factorial, this is the number of ways to order n objects when order matters. So this is going to be n, n minus 1, n minus 2, 3, times 2, times 1. So there are maybe n ways to choose the president. So there are n minus 1 people remaining who could be vice president, and then n minus 2 could be treasurer, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't want to choose all n people, maybe you only want to choose k, you know, it's n, n minus 1, all the way down to n minus k minus 1. That's the number of ways to choose k people from n when order matters. So this is choose k from n order matters. Okay? So 3 factorial would be 3 times 2 times 1 or 6. 5 factorial, 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 would be 120. What's nice is if you know 3 factorial, 4 factorial is just 4 times 3 factorial. So this leads to a very nice way to compute. What should 0 factorial be? How many ways should there be to choose no one from a group of n people? No. One. one. You know, this. So if I, if I have no people, how many ways can I order them? Sorry, I, I think I phrased it wrong the first time. There's one way to do nothing. You can't do nothing in many different ways. You're actually doing something in those different ways. There is one way to do nothing. I am choosing a way to order no people. We 
Just let that be one. Later in the semester, if people are interested, I will show you that negative one half factorial is the square root of pi. It's one of the strangest results in mathematics. You know, this sounds like a magician, you know, sawing somebody off in half and then doing some kind of strange magic trick. So the number of ways to order negative half of a person is the square root of pi. Okay? If there are k people, how many ways are there to order k people? So I have k people, how many ways can I order k people? K factorial. So here, this is, I'm choosing k people from n when order matters. If order doesn't matter, I divide by k factorial. So as a cultural extra credit, who are the four Pac-Man ghosts? Somebody got in the first class. Names of the four Pac-Man ghosts. Inky? Blinky? I know. <laughs> it's, the stinky is natural. I sometimes say stinky by mistake. Uh, Pinky, and the other one is Clyde. <laughs> so the four Pac-Man ghosts are Inky, Blinky, Pinky, and Clyde. So there are four factual ways to order them. 24 ways. In six of the ways, Clyde will be first. In six of the ways, Clyde will be last. So if I wanted to choose four people from N, this is where order doesn't matter. This is how many ways I could choose four people. But then I have to realize I've double counted now if I don't care about order. I've counted all the ones where Clyde is first as different from the ones when Clyde is last. So it's sometimes easy to first put it in order and then remove it. We often write this as N choose K. If you think about it, the numerator is screaming something at you. What does the numerator look like? What does the numerator want to be? So, so much of math is looking at algebra, looking at expressions and finding a way to attack the algebra and see the pattern. That's another reason why I want to spend so much time on this. What does the top kind of look like? N times n minus one times da, 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 times n minus n minus k minus one. What does that look like? Yeah, or at least factorial. the start of it. It looks like a factorial. Which factorial? N factorial. N factorial. So if I wanted to make this n factorial, all I have to do is just put in an n minus k factorial. Can I just mm -hmm. multiply the top by n minus k factorial? No. This is like the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments of the US Constitution. Right? You must treat everybody equally. You must treat both parts of an equation, both parts of an expression equally. If I multiply by n minus k factorial up top, what must I do? Multiply, multiply on the bottom. And now you see we've just multiplied by 1. So, so much of mathematics is trying to find good ways to multiply by 1 or add 0. One of my math professors, Peter Jones at Yale, made the great remark one day that the log of 1 is 0. So there's really only one thing you can do. And you want to get good at seeing when you should do this. This was the key step in a lot of the calculus proofs. Now, we get that this is just n factorial over k factorial, n minus k factorial, or n choose k or sometimes people write on calculators NCK. So this is the really good notation. And in fact, you can start proving a lot of interesting results about these coefficients. This is the number of ways to choose k people from n. If you want to be a little crueler, it's the number of ways to exclude n minus k people from n. If we're choosing k people for something special, we're then selecting out n minus k people not to have something special. You could prove this algebraically by replacing k with n minus k and seeing if it's the same, or you can do a proof by story. How many of you have seen Pascal's triangle? So you often see Pascal's triangle with this. If I look at x plus y to the n, this is x to the n plus n, x to the n minus 1, y, which has n, plus dot, 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 plus y to the n. This is the same as the sum k goes from 0 to n, n choose k, x to the k, y to the n minus k, or it's the same as the sum k goes from 0 to n, n choose k, x to the n minus k, y to the k. So this is the binomial theorem. Okay? 
So you've sometimes seen this maybe in Pascal's triangle. So if I want to just write down what the different rows are, we have 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, 1, 4, 6, 4, 1, and so on and so on and so on. Each number is the sum of the one above to the left and above to the right with ones on the extreme. And one way you can think about this is if I have x plus y cubed, so x plus y to the 4, I have four factors. <coughs> when I multiply this out, each term is going to have some number of x's and some number of y's. And the number of x's plus the number of y's, you know, the sum of their powers has to be 4. Let's say I want a term x cubed y. How would I get a term that's x cubed y? I would have to choose x three times and y once. So for each factor, I choose x or y, choose x or y, choose x or y, choose x or y. How many ways, if I have four factors, can I choose three of the four factors to be x? So I have four factors, and I want three of the four factors to be x. How many ways are there to do that? Six. It's six, but in terms of binomial coefficients, it's four choose three. I have four numbers, or I have four places, I have four factors, and I have to choose three of them to be my ones generating my x. This is why the binomial coefficients come into Pascal's triangle. We've used this in calculus. You know, where did you use this in calculus? You used this when you were doing differentiation. So after this, we will then shift to the movies. So if you want to calculate the derivative of x to the n, this is the limit as h goes to 0 of x plus h to the n minus x to the n over h. We have to understand x plus h to the n. Well, x plus h to the n by the binomial theorem is x to the n plus n x to the n minus 1 h plus n choose 2 x to the n minus 2 h squared. Everything here is h squared or higher. h squared, h cubed, h to the 4. So how do we prove the derivative? When we subtract off x to the n, that cancels this part here. We divide by h, so that's going to give us an nx to the n minus 1. Good, this has no h dependence now. When I said h to 0, that's going to just give me what we expect. And now when I divide by h, every term here is going to be left with at least a power of h. And now when I send h to 0, those terms will be 0, and that's the proof. I actually don't need the full strength of the binomial theorem. I just need to know it starts off x to the n plus nx to the n minus 1h plus other stuff. But this is how you prove the derivative of x to the n. So can someone tell me what the derivative of x to the square root of 2 would be? So what's the derivative of x to the root of 2? Somebody want to guess? Thank you for being brave and saying this, yes. It's correct, but you almost surely have not seen a correct proof of that. This proof crucially uses the fact that n is an integer. So I want you to think about this over the weekend. We are using that n is an integer to expand things out. How did your calculus professor or teacher prove to you that derivative of x to the root 2 is root 2x to the root 2 minus 1? What does it even mean to raise x to the root 2th power? I know what it means to square a number or cube a number. What does it mean to raise it to the root 2? So you know, I will let you think about that. That's where they probably slipped something by you on the calculus. All right. So for those watching at home, the next part, sadly, is not going to work because I'm using the low-quality camera. But I will post the videos online. All right. So the first is just going back a little bit to some applications of lines. So 
Alright. How many of you have seen the movie Tron? All right. It was a commercial failure, sadly, when it came out, but it was groundbreaking in terms of special effects. Yes, this is groundbreaking. Okay. What do you notice about the special effects for the most part? The squares, they're lines. And so they're entering the game grid. Uh, they're about to start the life cycle. This is from the movie. And so you can see they're basically just doing lines. And in a couple of places, you know, you have some curves for the light cycles. Those were a little bit harder. But, uh, we've got a circle there. But okay, that's not so bad. But you, if you look at what's going on, essentially everything is a line. So I will show some lines from art. Uh, this is from Mass Mocha. This is Solowit. My daughter thrilled me years ago when she said that that was the Star Trek symbol. So this is one of my favorite artists. This is Thomas Eakins, shad fishing at Gloucester on the Delaware River, 1881. And so what people noticed many years after his death is they were going through someone's attic, and they found a picture of these four people in the same pose, same clothes, and a highway in New Jersey. And they examined Egan's painting, and they noticed there were little dots in strategic places around the people. So th the main theoretical idea today was the equation of a line. What Egan's wanted to do was save time and not have to calculate the perspective and the relative sizes correctly. He just projected a picture onto a screen and just made some dots and told some of his students and protégés about this but did not advertise this because that would be considered cheating at the time. Tron, now those were great special effects. Right? You have to remember you're living, say, late 70s, early 80s. If this is before computer-generated special effects. Star Wars was all models. Last Starfighter, I think that was 18, 1984, was the first movie with a computer-generated spaceship. Tron was not eligible for Academy Award for special effects because the Academy felt they cheated by using computers. Mm. Right. Compare that to today, where you can't often tell now if that's a real person. You know, sometimes the actor actress dies, oh yeah, no, no problem, we'll just computer generate them and put them back in the movie. It doesn't matter that they're dead now. Mm. All right, so what I wanna do now is I wanna end with something about Pascal's triangle. So this is not gonna show well sadly on the screen. So Pascal's triangle, we start like this, and we're gonna play a game. The game is called I Hate the Evens. So if a number in the Pascal triangle is even, we delete it. If it's odd, we put a dot in its place. And then the question is, what kind of structure will emerge as we go further and further down Pascal's triangle? Now, I couldn't find a program on, online, a video online that did this, so I wrote my own code. You could write a better code than this. I was using Mathematica. It was more convenient for me not to have my triangle starting at the top and going like this, but to start at the side and go out like that. Now, as I get more and more rows, I'm going to need to spread out over larger and larger regions. That's not going to be physically practical. So what I've done is I've always rescaled so that at every moment in time, it's always going to draw however many rows I have here. So this is basically one moment in time, the first two rows. This is row zero, this is row one. Your Pascal's triangle starts off one, one, one. Okay? So I'm going to let time evolve now and let you see what Pascal's triangle looks like mod two. Uh, it's running so slowly right now you can't really see anything. It hasn't even reached two. All right, good. Now it's got another. All right. Make it go a little faster. Uh, when you begin to see any kind of structure, let me know. Triforce. What's it looking like? Triforce. What's a triforce? Uh, you'll have to you'll have to email me that so I can look that up. There's lots of triangles. Lots of triangles. Let's go a little faster. It's the same thing. It's a fractal pattern constantly repeating. It's Sierpinski's gasket or Sierpinski's triangle. It's very similar to the Cantor set. The Cantor set was throwing away the middle third. 
take an equal out triangle, subdivide it to four small equal out triangles, throw away the middle. For each of the three remaining, do that again, do that again, do that again. This is Pascal's triangle. How many of you have seen Pascal's triangle before? How many of you have ever looked at Pascal's triangle like this? Okay. Okay, not too many. So one of the goals of this class is I really want you to revisit a lot of the math you've done. There's a lot of beauty and a lot of applications and stuff available. So great mathematics. So this is a good place to end. I will right, we'll let it run a little bit further. It's a nice fun exercise to see how you can generate this quickly. All right.